I rarely do speed work, despite being a big supporter of Louis Simmons and the conjugate system. This video will explain why. Now don't get me wrong, I love it and plan on reintroducing it sometime in the near future, specifically for athletic goals and overall calisthenics performance, because now it's not just about 100% absolute strength. We're talking about speed strength in which the velocity is naturally going to be higher. So targeting explosiveness directly absolutely matters in this case. But for regular lifters that are only trying to raise the general strength and get bigger, the need for this kind of goes down. In truth, there are two principles that are common in all the best programs. The first is correct exercise selection that is specific to what you're trying to improve upon. That could be training the competition lift itself or doing accessories that automatically raise it. You also pair that with the right percentage. In the case of a strength athlete, you're not only going to be in the 60 to 70% range. You'll typically creep it up to 80, 90%. Maybe doing some fives, triples, doubles, singles. We go heavy if we want to maximize the neurological gains and the skill of lifting heavier loads. And then the second thing is a decent workload trying to maximally hypertrophy all the muscles that contribute to these big compound movements. In the case of the bench press, you want watermelon pecs, horseshoe triceps, and boulder shoulders. And for squats and deadlifts, you want gorilla glutes, titanium erectors, and tree trunk quads. And of course, some other muscles too, but I'm just talking about the main stuff here. Oh, and your hamstrings too. Lots of meat is important, specifically for your pulse. So if you get as jacked as humanely possible and you're specific to your sport, that in itself is probably going to get you 95% of the gains you ever want. And this also makes sense in the context of the original West Side programming. Some of you are not aware of this, but it didn't start off with the max effort method and dynamic effort method. Originally, and this still got guys to elite numbers, world-class strength here, it was double max effort days. So why did they drop it? They were too darn strong. The absolute load on recovery beat them to the ground. So the dynamic effort method was not originally incorporated for the speed factor. Sure, people talk about force equals mass times acceleration, but we all know that you can't match a single with eight sets of three at 60%. It's not the same thing. Yeah, it's better than moving slowly and compensatory acceleration matters. There's also studies that prove this as well, but heavy weights move differently from speed work. That's just a fact. So although that could be important in improving your technique, getting more volume in and you're moving explosively, what we're really doing is managing our recovery. It blends itself better in the overall program, which minimizes overuse, gives you better recovery overall, and you come in next max effort day feeling that much more fresh. Basically, it's less of a headache for you. And if you follow the waves, you should make consistent progress. So that's why it does work. Okay, that's why I'm not biased here. But many of the benefits that powerlifters seek are not exclusive to the method, which is why his popularity has plummeted. It can easily be swapped for something else that's either submaximal, like what you see in typical RPE-based programming, or going heavy once more, which is what I chose during my bench press journey. And the reason I went with this, despite being a lifetime natural, is that I'm not as strong as the original West Siders were. So on all their max effort variations, they would probably be in the 400s or 500s. Whereas the hardest variation I've done was a 315 Swiss bar bench press with 90 pounds of chains. And if I was doing a raw variation, it would be in the low to mid 300s. So even if I went at 100%, the systemic fatigue is not going to be the same as a super elite bencher. It's why Julius Maddox can only use the max effort method once every two weeks. It's because when he's going in the 700s, that cannot be replicated every single week. So this is something that I discussed many years ago with Omar Yusuf, and it's so freaking true. The stronger you are, the harder it is to recover, even if you're doing the exact same exercises and volume. It's why, at the start, deadlifts are one of the best hypertrophy exercises you could do until you're pulling around 500 pounds or so. Now, you feel beat down workout to workout. So you start doing RDLs, trap bar deadlifts, good mornings. You're trying to make the leverage is more difficult, such that you get more out of less weight. That's where that becomes important when you're already really strong. But working up to that point, you can probably do a hell of a lot more damage. And I'm talking about good damage and not feel as bad as you thought you were going to. So that's what I did. 
using two different variations. One would be an overload. The other one would be more raw ish. And I literally acquired the best strength gains of my life. Now that said, I fully recognize this is not for everyone. And I will say right now that I would not recommend it for most people. You should probably be an advanced lifter before attempting this and everything about your lifestyle will have to be perfect. In my case, I was sleeping between eight and 12 hours a night. And no, that is not an over-exaggeration. It varied though. And I was in a massive calorie surplus. So if you're not thinking, well, that's unrealistic, don't click off just yet. I'm gonna share an alternative. I get a lot of questions on what can you replace dynamic effort with? There's two things you can realistically do. One is swap out the wave for any other wave. A good approach would be stealing the small off junior template and running those percentages in a three week wave and repeating or doing it more long term than that, which is purely an example, by the way. I'm not saying to do this specifically. It could also be just add one set a week and maybe drop the reps down if you have to. So week one, three sets of 12. Week two, four sets of 10. Week three, five sets of eight. Or you keep the reps exactly the same and just increase the sets. Maybe you could run a five by five setup or work up to three sets of one to 90%. There are endless options to choose from and I'm not going to discuss every single one of them. So that's the first thing you can do. Swap it for something that also has a history of being effective. The second choice, which might just be the best for most of you, is skipping that aspect of your training altogether, going directly into volume work and all your little accessories. Logically speaking, what do we know about optimal weekly sets? 10 to 20 is all you really need. So let's say you're peaking that. Monday included 10 sets for your chest. Thursday, you come back in and you're skipping the speed work, but everything you do right after that still equates to 10 sets. You still have 20 sets a week for chess. So why would that affect your size in any type of way? It wouldn't. And that's why a lot of people are getting great gains in spite of it. So take any generic conjugate program you can find on the internet and get rid of the speed work. We're changing our mindset from max effort day and dynamic effort day to max effort day, volume day, or simply put intensity day, volume day, which is exactly what I've been saying for years. It's literally that simple. You do maxes and hypertrophy work, and when progress stalls, you rotate variations. That's all there is to it. Speed work is effective, but many strong lifters don't do it. And with these subtle changes, you should be perfectly fine. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Let's see your feedback in the comments section. What's your experience been like with using the dynamic effort method or removing it completely? I'd love to hear it. I'll talk to you next time.